their portfolio sites. It didn't require millions of dollars. It didn't require years and years. They said, we got to get it done. And years ago, they identified Eastern Merced County. We come back later with data, and it highlights. Same thing for Vina Plains, same thing for Jepson Prairie. So they were onto something that didn't require a huge government program. It was like, let's just conserve it. That's what we're going to do. So uh, now this is a, a different perspective. Um, Merced County also happens to fit within this larger corridor. And there's been, for a long time, an interest to conserve a, a corridor of, of natural habitat all the way from the valley basin up to the crest of the mountains to the east. And this is a long-term vision of the Nature Conservancy, Joe Silvera, uh, me, and some others are like, how do we do this? And uh, what you see here is the, the eastern part is uh, national forest and Yosemite National Park and the BLM land. There are some wildlife refuges in the west. And the really unprotected zone is eastern Merced County and the lower Sierra foothills. And so uh, I'm going to propose tonight that we form a working group to uh, conserve this corridor. And when all we need is like six people that all they want to do is conserve this corridor. So, and I'm totally serious about that. Um, it's a really cool area. We're working on some lands up in the foothills, and we're trying to get it done. So uh, now I'm going to talk about this process of land conservation. Um, again, what I want you to pay attention to as I go through it is, is the nuances, you know, where the money came from, the different kinds of people involved, the different agencies, things like that. I wish I had a longer time to talk about it. It's just it's kind of brief, but I'm going to go through it. So when I arrived in Merced County um, to uh, start working in the area, um, with the, the blessings of the East Merced RCD, um, there was 5,000 acres conserved. This is on the Flying M Ranch, and whoever knows it, that's where the power mosey takes place. Uh, it's 14,000 acres, but about 11,000 acres of just gorgeous, vulnerable habitat. So back in the uh, mid-'80s, there was a proposal to put a nuclear power plant out here. And John Myers, also a character, he was a, um, a pilot, an avid pilot, uh, but he fell in love with this area and started buying lands and he assembled his ranch. So he put a conservation easement on his ranch just to kind of stop the potential thinking about a nuclear power plant. But this is the first place where conservation came from. Okay, we'll take that. <laughs> it worked out. Uh, he added another uh, later, so it ended up to be a total of 5,000 acres. And by 1998, there was 5,000 acres only in this whole region. Um, so I, I got to work. And by 2000, we had done one easement. This is on the Fury Ranch, about 615 acres. We got the money from the Department of Conservation. Uh, it was a cool process. I met Steve Johnson there and started working with the Nature Conservancy and formed a really good partnership. It was very really important. Um, so then we got into an interesting time. This is the Chance Ranch. And uh, this is 8,500 acres. And that's the photo I showed you at the beginning. It was a really great ranch to conserve. Uh, that was an interesting one where the TNC owned the Howard Ranch up in Sacramento, a 12,000-acre ranch that was conserved already, and they orchestrated a, a swap. They would put an easement on this ranch, and he would pick up fee title. And I wrote around with Jim, and he said to me, I'm not kidding you, John. I'm in this for getting some land. <laughs> it was really cool. But uh, he was getting 12,000 acres or 8,000 acres, but the thing about the 12,000 acres is a third of it was under a WRP easement that said that you could pull the, they could pull the ranching off if they wanted to. He said, well, that's not my land then. And so he did a good deal and he got this thing, but that was a big thing. Behind the scenes at this point in time, there's a lot of work going on to figure out how to stop Eusimer said from being constructed right there. 30 million bucks got put into the state budget. Um, that was TNC had a big role in that. And it was just strictly to buy easement lands out in this area. Uh, on top of that, um, I had by in, in pretty quick order, I had developed good relations with about 15 ranchers covering about 50,000 acres, and we were in the middle of preparing a regional guide um, that they, they let me on their properties to do like species-specific rare species surveys on all these ranches. I don't know why yet, but they, they trusted me. But it set a foundation. Now we had willing landowners or landowners we could talk to, and we had funding. And so things got going. So in that year, that's the Cunningham Ranch, that's the Nelson Ranch, that's the Robinson Ranch, and that was just cool. So now I'm, uh, I guess, three years into my work. I had a goal of 30,000 acres. Well, we're up to 20, 25,000. That's pretty good. So um, after this, um, the next one, I'm going to, so this is the UC Merced site, and there's a bunch of people from UC Merced here. This is a complicated one to talk about, but basically there was a 10,000 acre property that covered that area, uh, the Smith Trust lands. It was put into an educational trust with the goal that for a dollar, an educational group could buy the land as long as they built the university and surround it with commercial development 
the taxes would go to, to uh, buy um, scholarships for all the, all the Merced County high schoolers that wanted to go to college. So it was very good, but it was right in the middle of this region. It was a titanic clash between like, you know, take care of the disadvantaged community or, or conserve habitat. Well, fortunately, the habitat here won out and we were able to get the university to move down to the southwest, mostly on a golf course. But it's a big story. I, I don't have time to go into it, but a very interesting story. So this is the other story that's interesting. I was in a meeting in about 2005, and we were all sitting around a big table somewhere out in Merced, maybe at the county offices. I remember Carol Witham was there. Jamie Marty was there. Um, Kay Goody was there. And she said, I'm not going to permit the university unless we preserve the Icord Ranch. And everyone's talking about the Icord Ranch. And I raised my hand, literally. And I said, has anybody talked to Paul? And they said, who's Paul? <laughs> and I said, Paul Eichert. He owns the ranch. And they said, no. And I said, well, I'll talk to him. And so I actually went to his house. Um, we talked for two hours. First hour and 45, we didn't talk about money or conservation easements. And then he says, all right, John, what are we talking about? And I said, well, there's $4 million bucks. It's got your name on it if you want it to conserve this place. He goes, all right. And he asked for a price that's a little bit high. He says, if you give me that price, we can do the easement. I'll tell you, it was, it was $12,000 per acre. And so we had an appraiser come out, and they appraised it at $12,001 per acre, because I told them, we need at least $12,000 an acre. It got rejected twice by the, uh, the government services. I kept up in it, and we finally got it submitted. And after about two years, we got, the, we got it approved at, at the price, and we closed easement. I thought that was, that's the indication of the kind of work it takes to actually get this thing done, and I wasn't going to give up. So after that, it seemed like the money kind of ran out, but we, we kept going. We got some funding for the JCR Ranch up north, um, beautiful ranch, and uh, that came from the, the BOR's conservation program. Uh, the, the Richards Ranch with some money from WCB. Uh, the Chances put another ranch under easement. Uh, and then the last one, as I mentioned before, is this, this 866 on Flying M Ranch. Um, that one was with um, NIFWIF in lieu fee funding for wetland impacts for uh, UC Merced. Uh, and also, um, it was the, the easement was held by the Rangeland Trust. So, all of these things, but is that kind of, you see the patterns that take place? I mean, we got really lucky, well, I don't know how to put it, but we got a lot of money when the UC Merced project, and we took advantage of it. And then when that slowed down, we kept at it, and we kept putting. So, my goal is to fill in all the little gaps over the next 20 years or something, or whoever wants to help me, you're welcome to. But this is a really cool landscape worth saving. So. That's what it looks like. That's what the ad hoc process, process looks like. There's no HCP, there's nothing guiding it, it's just people doing their thing. So out of that came this idea to write a book that would stimulate the ad hoc process throughout the whole Central Valley. And my idea was, why don't we identify really key habitats that people aren't aware of and put it in some kind of publication, they can read it and fall in love with it and want to conserve it all over the valley. That's basically the idea of the book. So in this, uh, oh, I'm going to go back. So in this talk, let's see. Let me see something real fast. OK, let me go back a little bit. So um, let me just mention one thing. So in this talk here, I'm going to have two parts. Um, I'm going through this part, and then I'll, I'll talk about, um, first I'm going to talk about, well, now we're into this part. I'm sorry, I got confused. So we'll keep going. So here's the, uh, the, uh, the steps of this conservation process. The first, you have to identify where you're going to do your conservation, right? You, we have to know that it's worth conserving, and we have to be aware of it. Usually biological studies, again, not multi-million dollar things, but fairly simple analyses, I think, get it done. Uh, and then once you got that, then how do you get the information out? How do you invoke interest? And then how do you cultivate individuals that are going to pick up the staff and carry it? So um, with the first one, we had good information. We had Keeler Wolf's and CDFW's preliminary report, these eight regions. We met with uh, Todd when we were doing this, and uh, they really stand up. They're really good regions. We did some minor adjustments to bring in some other easement, uh, uh, rural polarities, but all in all, it was a really good start. So we were going to say, okay, these eight regions is, are, are chapters. And then uh, the other thing we had was the, the re core recovery areas that were in the, in the Vernal Pool Recovery Plan. We were thinking about doing this massive uh, conservation planning exercise, and I was talking to Carol with them, and she said, why don't you just use the core recovery areas, John? They've been done, and they were really carefully thought out. And I said, right on. That saved us a lot of time, and it also built on the work that had been done. That was important. So um, here is a map that comes out of the, uh, the Killer Wolf preliminary report, and uh, it's a good report. What I want to say is that it was made for a scientific audience. 
It, 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 I've used these and the recovery plan. They're excellent reports, really good analysis, but they're black and white without a lot of color. This is a sample map from, from the north uh, East Sacramento Valley region, which is we're in the middle of right now. Here's one from the recovery plan, the same area. Uh, and then here's a drawing of uh, Hoover Spurge. And uh, you would have to be a serious bot to think that's really cool, you know? <laughs> and so I looked at this and I was like, how do we bring it to life, you know? And uh, that's Hoover Spurge. It's a beautiful plant, right? And uh, when you're in this region, you hear about the Tuscan Formation. They say, oh, it's this volcanic formation. And it does these things. But there's no pictures of it. That's a badass formation. This is a, a lahar mudflow that came out of the, out of the well, what's now the Cascades about two and a half million years ago. And the vernal pools on it are more etched than, than, than uh, it's just such a weird habitat. So, um, so I said, how are we going to get to this kind of inspirational? So first, I hired. Evan Keeler Wolf, who is Todd's son, who's a really exceptional landscape photographer who had gotten into drone imagery. And I wanted to go to every geological surface in the Central Valley and take really cool drone shots. We did it in 22, and it was horrible because it was dry. And then we freaking got the rain last year, and that was awesome. Uh, and the other is we went to Cal Photos, and we, we brought in photos of all the species that are, so you could say, oh, that's Hoover Spurger, that's Longhorn Fairy Shimper, that's the Delta Green Ground Beetle, or that's Jim's Clover. These are things we hear about, but to show them, and to show them to someone who's not a botanist, it's really important. So um, let's see. So here's the, the layout of the, of the guide. Um, I have a short introduction, short methods, two pages each. Why? Because I don't want to clog it down with like a long preamble. I just want to get to it. So it, it talks about the purpose. It's, it's quite focused. The methods are short. We have an appendix with all the detailed methods. So one thing about this guide is that I wanted to keep it rigorous scientifically. I wanted to have satisfy the scientists and satisfy the non-scientists. So all the methods are there in the back, but they're not up front, so it doesn't clog it. Um, and then we had two main sections. The chapter three uh, was really kind of the setting for the conservation part. And then chapter four were these conservation guides. And we have eight guides, uh, one for each region in the valley. And they really bring to life these eight regions that Todd Killer Wolf and his colleagues laid out you know, in 1998. So um, I'm just going to show you some highlights. Uh, you can get copies of the book, as I say, and you should read it. It's really cool, I think. Uh, but uh, here's just the beginning of chapter three. Everyone talks about playa pools. Well, here's a picture of playa pools on, on the right. That's from the Vina Plains, which is also right nearby. Um, that's what a Mima Mound topography looks like. Uh, this is a picture that I call my, my benediction. Uh, but uh, my daughter is a really good um, artist, and so I asked her if she could do some, some paintings and drawings of uh, some of the rare plants. And we didn't know where we were going to put them, but we put them here, and then I wrote a poem, and uh, it happened to be an oval shape, so we put a circle around it and made it blue, so it looks like a vernal pool. But, you know, you got to have a benediction for any kind of religious text, so that's important. <laughs> uh, then, then we added bells and whistles beyond just, though this is called Tales of Evolution of Great Valley Vernal Pools. And there's some really cool stories. The adaptive radiation, where the ore cut grasses came from, where all the shrimp came from, niche uh, kind of um, occupation by the Lasthenias, and then also a little section on the, the tiger salamander and the spadefoot, which were speciated by the rise of the Sierra. I mean, that's really cool. So. Uh, it just, it was, I was thinking about students at that point, like if you read this and you got interested, you want to do a master's degree on this stuff. So it was like a bell and whistle type thing. Uh, we also have this section where Evan had done so many cool photos and I said to him, you're an artist, not a biologist. Take some really cool pictures of just shapes and forms and, and not that we know what they are. I don't care about landscapes and horizons. I just want shapes. So we put them all here and we, uh, we put them by the regions and then the woman helping me put this together Brilliant idea. She put little thumbnails of the different sites. And you can just look at it and say, oh, I see. That's the Tulare Basin. And that's the Jepson Prairie. And oh, that's the Tuscan over there. And, and you can check it out. But this is uh, it's to appeal to the artists and all of us. And that's the point of that. So the other section I have, which I've looked at, I wish I had made it a separate section because it's so important. But I'll call it a geological journey through the Great Valley Vernal Pool landscapes. But we all hear about Riverbank and Modesto, maybe, I don't know, I do. And uh, it's really complicated. Um, uh, we have about 28 different la land for geological formations in the valley. 
And I've read um, so many papers and so many books and really tried to understand it. And I was like, how about if we go take pictures of them? And the idea came from this. Um, well, here's the 28 types. Then. Like, if you hand that to anybody but a hardcore geomorphologist, they're going to be like, I'm sorry, I'm walking away. Um, but something happened in 2001. I was flying over the region when I was working for Merced. I was reading all about geology. I had gone walking on the Flying Emma Ranch with Bob Holland, and he was teaching me. I remember walking in the landscape, and I said, oh, this must be Riverbank. And he just shook his head in disgust. You know, he's like, no, that's not Riverbank. <laughs> I was like, okay, I won't speak until I know what I'm talking about. But I looked down, it wasn't right here, it was at the corner of Cunningham Road and 140, but I looked down at sunset and there, I could see it. And um, I'd read about the, the Merton Formation, I'd read about the Riverbank Formation. Merton Formation's about 5 million years old, Riverbank's about 400,000 years old. Merton has smeary, kind of weak bounded pools and often huge playa pools where the conservancy shrimp and the, the neostatphia lives. And then Riverbank has these really hummocky pools. That's where San Joaquin orcut grass lives. Very different types. So here's the two species that live on the different surfaces. This is something Bob Holland also taught me early on. It was pretty cool. He, he kind of discovered it. Um, so here's a little map. And Carol Witham might think I've got this badly labeled, but I thought I would give it a shot. Uh, so you can see the different kind of terrain. The, the, the Merton is on more of these kind of smeary landscape. It's basically a clay soil. And then the riverbank is more hummocky. I imagine some of these might actually be a, kind of a weathered Merton, but especially on the left up that valley, that's definitely a riverbank. And it has a totally different look. But imagine riverbank sitting on top of Merton, three feet deep, with a 4.5 million year time gap. I thought that was really cool. And I saw this out the plane, and something came to life. And I was like, oh, that's what these geologies are. That's what it's all about. And one day, I wanted to make a book, and I was going to do a guide with these photos and finally got my chance to do it. So if you are interested in the geology, and you ought to be because it really drives the biodiversity, you should read this section and look at the pictures and it will come to life and then go visit them. It's really interesting to do. So um, I wanted to just point out one, one of the formations I talk about in the book. Uh, this is Valley Springs Formation. It's uh, white ash, like tough, deposited 20 million years ago when the, the area that is now the Sierra Nevada didn't exist yet, and it was blowing volcanoes kind of like the Cascades is doing now. And it's blowing white ash, and it's landing in a deltaic area on the edge of the inland sea because the Central Valley is not yet full of sediments. And, uh, and then it gets buried. And it gets buried for about 15 million years. And then the Sierra Nevada starts rising up, and a little bit gets exposed on about a quarter mile wide thing that goes from about Oroville to Merced. And it's this really, it's this cool formation. If you look at it, that white is not alkaline. It's a, it's a white ash soil. And the vernal pools are really weird, and the mounds are weird. The mounds are like these strange little mounds. Uh, the pools are, the soils are super acidic, and so the pools are acidic. And if you look at them, they're either milky white or they're weirdly clear, and you look into them. Um, it's just a really interesting habitat. And there's two species that live almost entirely on this, on this habitat. Uh, on the left is Pincushinabridia, and you can see the species name is Nadrida Myers. I, that's named after John Myers, the owner of the Flying M. It was discovered by Bob Holland and Tom Griggs when they were doing their uh, nuclear power plant surveys. And then Pseudobahia bahiafolia, or Hartwick's Golden Sunburst, which is um, one of my favorite rare plants. We were hired a, back, a ways back by the service to do a, um, a status survey, and we had a really good time looking for that species. Um, so uh, here's the range, and you can see the red dots are CNDDB occurrences, and it basically traces the, the location of the, of the Valley Springs formation. But I'll point out something interesting. That, I don't know if you can see it, but the bottommost red dot is actually, I don't know, 60 miles south of the last of the known Valley Springs formation. And you're like, what's it doing out there? Well. 800,000 years ago, something got laid down called Turlock Lake Formation, and it's a granitic formation from the Sierra. But I don't know why, but there's a little inclusion around Fryant, northeast of Fresno. It's called Rockland Sandy Loam Pumiceous Variant. So it's made of pumice, uh, weathered down, and it creates the weirdest sort of pools. Check these out. Uh, I drove by this site for years, and I'm, I, told, I told Evan, you've got to go photograph this. And he brought these back. I was like, oh, that's so cool. 
So what's, what's cool about this, it's a, it's a pumice soil. Um, it's I got acidic uh, pools and acidic soils. And it's got these two little disjunct populations of, of Hartwick's golden sunburst and pincushion abradia. So that's the kind of thing you get to understand when you get into the geology of the rural pools. It's, it's a really cool thing. So here's a, just a quick uh, summary of the guide. Again, I'm not going to do much. This is the, uh, the, the beginning of the northeastern Sacramento Valley rural pool region. Uh, you know, we have a, a, an opening. We have a nice map that shows uh, what the key features are. But again, it's color, and it's beautiful, and it's got real information. So even if you're not a biologist, it, it means something to you. Uh, here's a, an example of a page. This is some of the iconic habitats. The top is uh, from uh, as Table Mountain Reserve down by Oroville. The bottom is a Tuscan Formation landscape, uh, somewhere just to the west of there. And it just gives you a sense of the flavor of this area. Uh, we have photographs of the iconic species. On the top uh, right is Jim's Clover, which is mostly on top of Table Mountain and then in the volcanics to the west. And then Butte County Meadow Foam, which is a, these are both, both those species are only occurring in this region. So we brought out those species that really mean something. So if you sit down and read it, you know what counts in this area. Um, but then we said, well, where are we going to do conservation? We already had the vernal pool recovery areas, but I've been doing a lot of work and there's only so much money. So how are we going to prioritize? And my idea is, why don't we find the 20 largest blocks remaining uh, as our sample set? And then why don't we do some analysis and try to get some subset of theirs where we pick up, I don't know, roughly 50% of the regional geology, 50% of the predicted habitat for these core rare species. And if we can save just those subset blocks, we've done a really good job of, of preserving the biodiversity of this vulnerable region. So it's kind of hard to see, but on that map, um, well, here it is. Uh, let's see. Well, these are some of the rules we did in, in, in developing. I've just kind of gone through those already. But, um, and then if you look at here, this is a, a now a map, this is a hotspot map from the um, Northeast Sacramento Valley region. You can see the red in the middle is the Vina Plains, which again, TNC figured out was a really important place decades ago. And it all stood up to the test of time. Lassen Foothills up north, uh, Table Mountain down south there. And if you look closely, it's kind of hard to see, but there's numbers one through 20 on little squares. The black ones are the selected, blocks that we think are important to conserve, uh, and the gray ones are also within the top 20 if somebody wants to go after those ones. Uh, here's a table. Uh, this is comparing the blocks uh, with geological formation, and at the bottom is a calculation of what percent we're picking up uh, with just the beige uh, rows are the ones that we said are the ones that should be conserved. Um, and we did this because um, we wanted scientists, this isn't just for you know, people that like vernal pools, it's also for scientists. So you can look at this, you can gauge it for yourself, you can decide if you're doing it to work. We actually passed this out to about, about 20 or 30 um, reviewers, so we had a pretty good review process. Um, and then we did a profile of each block. This is block one, it's the biggest one in the region. Uh, that picks up the Vina Plains on the north part and some unconserved stuff. Um, we showed the areas that were already conserved, so you didn't have to go about that. And then we also have in the background, the assessor's parcel boundaries, because I've learned in conservation that if you come to a spot that's got 60-acre parcels, you can walk away. You're just not going to conserve that. You need 640-acre, 320s, you know, something you can actually work with. And so who owns the land is really important. So we've also got some notes on the side about um, where the funding came from for the conserved parcels, who holds the conservation easement. In the chapter, we talk about who's the most active in the region. So if you want to work here, uh, you say, oh, I get it. The Nature Conservancy has been really active. The, the, um, the Butte Environmental Council, or maybe Aqua Alliance now, or there's other groups. And so you kind of know where to start, who to talk to, how to get it going. And so this is the guide part of it. So just in uh, kind of finishing, we, we designed each regional chapter that you could read the whole thing really in a day and end up with a really good understanding of what that region's all about. Um, for me, when I did this before, it took weeks of multiple sources of information. I had to read this and that and get the NDDB drop down and look at a list of species. Well, it's all here now. So you can look at it and get inspired uh, in, in, a, in a fairly short read. And that, that's what we want to do. Um, and the last step we're doing is disseminating results. Here's, here's my goal, and I would like to propose this to you all, is that we, we've, hard, we've got 1,000 hard copies printed. 
and there, we're giving them out for free from here. We've also, Backcountry Press has got some, and you can buy them through there. That's 20 bucks to cover mailing cost and handling. But um, uh, we've also got an e-book e, e that you can get, you can download from Backcountry Press's site. Um, and uh, now we're giving presentations like this one here. Uh, and then I've, I'd like to talk to some of the university about maybe having a, a course that kind of tracks this. Uh, the idea of inspiring the next generation of vernal pool biologists with beautiful pictures and a desire to go rambling around and conserve it. So that's what we've done here. Um, and uh, the last thing is this idea of these target blocks we've identified. My goal is that kind of like the core recovery areas, they get adopted, they're in everybody's GIS database, Fish and Wildlife Service, Fish and Game, old time, uh, all the land trusts, the mitigation banking companies, everybody says, okay, this is what we're gonna do, kind of like this is East Merced Grasslands, let's conserve it. This is the Jepson Prairie, let's conserve it. Well, let's do it for these blocks. I'm in the Northeast Sacramento Valley. Here's where we're gonna do it. Okay, we all agree. When you send money to try to get funding from WCB, they say, is it one of the blocks? You know, So you know, it's a little uh, more narrowed, but uh, my, my goal and my vision is that we, we together as a community adopt them and say, sure, you could look at the science, you can adjust them if you want to, but, but that's the, the concept. It's a subset of the core recovery areas. We did build off of that, um, but it's really the biggest chunks left. So that's the idea. So that's the heart of conservation, is uh, working to help permanently conserve a natural area that you love. And this book was designed to do that for vernal pools. So I wanted to give a couple of really important acknowledgements. Um, we've worked with the, the EPA's Wetland Program Development Grant for a number of years, and the funding has been really essential. Um, we started out with Paul Jones, and now it's uh, um, uh, Joseph uh, Morgan is the, is the lead now. Russell is here, Russell Huddleston, and he, he was in, important in that. Uh, we got funding from the Wildlife Conservation Board, and a really important source. The Eastern Merced RCD has been an incredible partner because as a private company, we can't get these grants, so we, we work with the RCD even on this project here. Um, we had some, a lot of reviewers um, that, that played an important role to, to look at it and make sure it was good. Um, the photographers were incredible. Evan Keeler Wolf, uh, my daughter's drawings, um, all went into it. So um, I think it's a really beautiful guide and it's kind of the capstone of about 25 years of work. Thank you. Wow, it's 50 minutes. I did it. That's good. Well, are there any questions? Oh, here comes so many for questions. Okay, uh, so I gotta read the kind of read the room here, but um, how has I guess the Sackett ruling affect your conservation slash funding strategies for uh, the Eastern Merced grasslands? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we still have state coverage of those wetlands, so they've lost federal coverage, um, and so. We're still working with the, uh, the NIFWIP program, the NLUFI program, if they're collecting funding. Um, so there, I think there will still be federal dollars coming through, but it basically narrows um, our sources of funding. If, if, if truly they're not federally protected and the federal program stop advocating for that, some of the money to go after is, is really not um, necessarily, mit that's mitigation dollars. It can just be conservation dollars uh, for federally listed species like the, uh, Central Valley Conservation Program is a federal program, but their goal is to preserve federally listed species, and these are in the vernal pools, and we've gotten a lot of funding from that group. So uh, it'll affect it, but kind of like the ad hoc process, we're going to keep rolling. That's the way it goes. Yeah. Thank you. Got a bad mic. Test, test. Um, yeah, I'm uh, curious, and you're disseminating this information. Have you done any presentations to like select high school students 
like smaller groups of high school students? Uh, we haven't yet. I mean, we just we, the book just came out on November 21st, so it's kind of fresh. And uh, this man needs a little break, maybe. You know, this is a big haul, so yeah, uh, we'll get to it. <laughs> maybe a little more funding too. We, we've gone uh, significantly over budget out of uh, my uh, passion for this whole subject. Yeah, so, I, I think yes, uh, I think it'd be a, appropriate to have a friend who's been a longtime organizer with what's called the Student. Climate and Conservation Congress is hosted sure. by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Yeah, and this seems like it might be appropriate. Yeah, well, I kind of to uh, kind of you know get a direct path um, talking to professors at some universities about how can we incorporate into the curriculum, and then get you know talking to the UC Merced Reserve staff and places that are have a natural flow of students through it that could get interested. My goal is to get. Uh, you know, another generation of, of um, motivated uh, vernal pool ecologist. So. Yeah, well, great. Yeah. Got a loud voice? Yeah. Hmm. I give you permission. Yeah. For the last, since 2003, I've had the pleasure yeah. of driving through there hundreds of times possibly at yeah. this point. And it is so sublimely beautiful. Yeah. I didn't know who was responsible for protecting that country. So yeah. thank you. Well, me and, me and others, it's a group effort for sure. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. Um, but I do have a question because I came down here from the Northwest, and 25 years ago, Art Krukeberg told me about Mima Mounds. Yes. Told me about all the theories about how they're, at that point, evolved, some of them quite odd. Yes. Um, but I still don't know what makes those mounds. Are there, has that been solved? Well, if I speak of it, I will create some enemies <laughs> because there's 140 different theories. Um, but if I may, I'm a, under certain circumstances, I'm a really big fan of the proponent that it's caused by um, burrowing rodents. And, uh, and here's why. Because uh, on relatively flat terrain with a hard pan, it rains, it fills up, and they all drown. And so they have to build a mound to not drown. And, then they, and you go out on the, the vernal grasslands in Merced, and the mounds are full of, of burrows. It's really cool. So it's weird that vernal pools are an accident if, if you take that approach. You know, they just, they're a byproduct of a mammal making a mound to not drown, and we end up all these cool species. And, I, you know, I was kind of wondering about that. And then one time I had a cage in my backyard, and I had a rabbit, and it kept trying to dig out. So I, I dug six inches down, I put wire down, and I put six inches on top. And within two weeks, the rabbit had built a mound. And it was making burrows in the mound. I'm like, there it is. So I think somebody from UC Davis should do a master's where they, they take 100, maybe 200 square feet, fill it with six inches of dirt, throw a bunch of ground squirrels into it, fill it with water, and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but you go to places like, you know, Modoc, you know, that's different. Uh, the Tuscan Formation with the volcanics, that's different. So there's, there are probably multiple ways. And... Uh, and I, it's really a hot topic when you're with a bunch of vernal pulagologists like, no, you're so stupid. Couldn't possibly be that. So, but I've, I've seen evidence for the, the small mammal brain. And I talk about it in the book. There's a section that talks about it. So, yeah. the broken mic. <laughs> right, they're dying. Do you want to yell it out? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. Well, I think the important part of the ad hoc process is there, there are individuals that work their butts off to get things done. And they can be in systems that are taking place. Like, you know, I got hired by the East Merced RCD because there was an interagency vernal pool initiative that gave money to an RCD that hired me, and I got to work. Um, the work that, uh, that uh, Todd Killer Wolf did with the preliminary uh, uh, assessment report, very important. The recovery plan, really important. Um, I don't know, I'm, it's just me. I have a little bit about a beef of like HCPs because they take 20 years and they, seems like most of the money goes to consultants and lawyers and where, where's the land conservation in that, you know? They have a role and they play an important role, but, um, and there is a framework and in the paper I wrote um, about uh, the, the profile of the East Merced grasslands and Jetson, and it's actually a, a, an appendix in this, in this book um, it looks at the important things that took place. 30 million bucks in the state budget really superpowered our ability to do easements out in this area. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the swap of the Chance Ranch. So, you know, I think the larger picture framework is super important and, uh, and, it, and it feeds everything. But, but each of those efforts are driven by people that really want to see it get done. Nobody's sitting around. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to discount those things, but uh, the, the emphasis really is, like, what do you do in your work to want to save vernal pools, and are you willing to, like, work your butt off to do it? And the people that are willing to do that, I mean, I would call out Carol Witham, who I've worked with for years, is just remarkable. Like, vernalpools.org, that, that came out through the university. It was like, this is not going to happen. And she put an enormous amount of personal work into that. Bob Holland, with his work on landscapes and you know all this stuff mapping of vernal pools some of that early work jamie marty um it's it's enormous work that gets done and it's there's an inordinate impact of these individuals that actually care about it i mean from my own standpoint i happened to develop a rapport with these ranchers and by the time the money came through i could go meet with them at their house and say hey you want to do this and they're like all right sounds good to me and so i, I had a, a significant impact on that relationship uh, and I don't know if it would have been somebody else. I'm not sure that would have got done. So I feel really good about that. So. Somebody back there? Oh, yeah. John Hunt. Right. Yeah. Right. Right on. Yeah, you just got to yell. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I mean, I'm going to still say we're all homo sapiens. And we're uh, originally, like, coming from 200,000 years ago. I'm sure all this has to do with, like, finding where you're supposed to get food and, like, where the little um, 
you know, the bulbs grow that you can eat. And now we don't do that, but now we're botanists and we wander like eight miles into an inland valley to look for some rare planets, something like that. Um, so I think we can still tap into our primitive soul. And, and uh, you know, if you grow up in an area that you fall in love with and you, you just feel it, I felt that for the Loomis Basin, you know, and it, uh, I watched it turn into, uh, you know, uh, Sun City over in Rockland. And I was like, okay, I don't want to do this. So I, that's got me motivated. So, um, but that, that terroir, there's a... Um, there's a man named, I think his name is, my daughter knows it better, Freeman House, I think. He wrote a book about working in the Matoll with salmon, and he totally expresses that feeling of, like, this is my place, and we're going to protect it. It's a cool feeling. So, yeah. Yeah. What do you do for fun? Me? How do you protect your personal life? And how do you supervise the same siblings equal if you're involved or not? Oh, that's a good. What do I do for fun well, let's see. We just came back from a seven-week trip to Tanzania and Australia. That was pretty good. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a mountaineer, um, and I like going out to the desert quite a bit. Uh, let's see. Well, oh, how has this affected my work? That's a really good question. I run a business. I have got 20 employees. That's got its own uh, difficulties of just managing time. And uh, uh, my kids are here. That's why I keep referring to them. But uh, I'm, I'm learning now to try to figure out how to, how to say no. Um, it, uh, I was super driven as, as just to do this stuff, but now I'm getting slow, slowing down. Supervisors. Um, we worked quite a bit with supervisors in Merced County. Uh, they were instrumental to passing some of the, some of the concepts. Uh, Deidre Kelsey, I was working closely with at the time, and some others. So, uh, of course, they have to appeal to their constituents. So she was always like, no, seriously, he's a nice guy, even though he says he likes to conserve land. You know, so there was a problem with that. So, we, you know, we got through that. But... Um, yeah, I, I, I haven't interacted with a lot of supervisors, but I think it's probably important. What's that? State assembly? Uh, not much with elected officials, mostly with, uh, with landowners, with land trust people, and with uh, federal and state agency and local agency people. That's mostly who I've worked with. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I understand. Yeah. I'm not sure, like, um, uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, I'm not sure how active the Indian tribes are there. That's where I've done a lot of work. In Eastern Merced County, I haven't seen that presence. Um, I know in, in coastal regions, it seems more common, maybe up in the Modoc area and things like that. So it, maybe it depends on where you work and kind of what the, um, kind of the history or the kind of the, the remaining presence of, a, of tribal involvement, I would say. I think that's a huge part of the Yeah. Right. I think I think that's right. Because it does get right down to this thing of like your place, you know? Yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, right, that's it. All right. Great with voice projection. It's on now. Oh, super. Um, that's good timing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, never heard my voice that loud before. <laughs> um, I was wondering, you talked quite a bit about um, how important your relationships with landowners are. I was yeah. wondering if you could talk just a bit about your um, approach to building those relationships and establishing trust. That's a great question. Uh, I, I remember talking to some people early on in my work in Merced, and they were kind of flabbergasted why if you owned an 8,000 acre ranch uh, and you were gonna get 1,000 bucks an acre to conserve it, why on earth wouldn't you, you know, and like what's wrong with you? And I learned early on that if you get between a person and the way they make a living, they're gonna hate you. Uh, and so Paul Eichard was a really important one there. And he's a rancher, he's a serious rancher, he loves his property, he's not gonna give it away. Uh, we had a long conversation about that. And then one day I took him out to his property. We were on ATVs. We went to that big plyo pool I showed you a picture of. That's on his ranch. And Neostatfield grows out there. It's also called the battery acid plant. And it's kind of a crowning achievement. I got him to sit on his ATV and chew uh, nutlets of the, of the Neostatfield Clusiana because it tastes really cool. He's like, that's pretty cool. And it kind of got him going. But basically, you have to say, what do you want with your land? And if they say, I don't want to put an easement on it, then you say, all right, we're done talking, you know, not a problem. And maybe we'll call you back two years later. 
but it's, it's voluntary, and they have to trust you. And I don't, know, I don't know what I look like. I wasn't raised on a ranch, but for some reason I go to this place with these huge ranches, and they're inviting me in, and I'm like, wow, this is working out. <laughs> you know, so something about honesty, uh, transparency, uh, seeing their worldview, being interested in what their lives are about. Everybody likes to be shined on, you know, and I didn't do it uh, artificially. I'd be like, wow, this is cool. You've got 10,000 acres you ranch? Tell me about it. And they say, oh, we'll get in my truck. We'll go check it out. And we talk, you know, talk about it all. And yeah, and then, yeah, for some reason they just like, well, all right, I'll do an easement. Sounds good to me. But, um, you know, it's, it's, this was kind of low, low hanging fruit back, and that was in the, in the 2000s. And, you know, a lot of them have done mitigation, has done a lot to corrupt that process because the prices are so high and it's gotten really different. Um, and some areas, like in southeast Sacramento County, it's just so heavily developed that it's going to be very expensive and difficult to conserve more land. Um, but, uh, no, it's, it's, about, it's about forming a genuine relationship and, and appreciating what they have. You know, it doesn't work if you're like, oh, you're a rancher, you're wrecking the land, well, your conversation's over. You know, and um, so really cool people. Jim Chance, the owner of that ranch, uh, we formed the Adventure Club, me and Jim. Uh, Valerie Gordon from the TNC and a guy named Devere Dressler. We all climbed to the top of um, Half Dome when he was 75. So they became my real friends. So it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. So she was wondering about what's the challenge of, of conserving the interconnecting areas. Um, I did hear that the Morrison Ranch just got conserved or is getting conserved. That's a, that's a, a big, like five, I think it's 5,000 acres uh, in that block. That's a big deal. Um, the Rodner Ranch links it together. We've been trying for years. The Mathis Ranch. We know who they are. Um, it's partly having people that care enough to pay attention. I got a little distracted, so I have kind of lost touch. But, um, you know, that's probably one I scale back so I can think about it again. I have a serious goal of getting the entire vernal pool habitat of the Flying M Ranch conserved before I die. And um, I know Wes and Lou, they're the, the, the grandsons of John Myers. We just did this 860 acres. They're business people. You know, this is not about conservation. I've never met a rancher that says, I'm saving my land for fairy shrimp, not one. Uh, they like open space. They like seeing like no turkey barns, you know, off to the side. They don't want to see trees. Uh, they like open space, and that's their value. And uh, if you can, you know, so if you can help and get that and get the funding they want. But I think that there's opportunities. I think it's going to be really hard to do anything other than rangeland in those areas because of irrigation. Uh, you know, the uh, Sigma uh, uh, regulations coming through are really restricting where you can put new wells. Uh, I can't imagine that the county would permit a housing development on top of that ridge. You know, there's no water. There's nothing to it. So I think the opportunities will come. But we, we need to have somebody or some few people that are... They're like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get the Rodden Ranch conserved. I'm going to get the Mathis Ranch conserved. And it'll happen. It'll happen. I think we're, gonna, we're hoping to get about another 1,200 acres in discussion with the Flying M Ranch that connects to the, from the UC Reserve to the one we just set up. And there's some good salamander habitat that can probably work out there. So we're looking at things like that. But I think it can be done. Yeah, I do. It's a, it's a unique area. Yeah. Hello. Over here. Yeah. Um, I've been lucky enough to do some forestic surveys on Muzzy Ranch, which I'm sure you're familiar oh, sure. with. So I was like horrified and shocked to see that land grab around Travis Air Force Base. Oh uh, yeah. For that super city that's right. To that's a huge so problem. So I was just wondering, like, what's your two cents, like, about all of that? Well, this is a weird one. If you've seen it, it's the Lafferty deal and uh, a bunch of silicone billionaires, including. Uh, Lauren Jobs and uh, some others have decided to build the city of the future uh, in eastern uh, Solano County. And I don't know what it's all about. They've been playing, paying like two to three times over the, uh, the fee title price. And now they're suing landowners for being somehow conspiracy. It's really weird for these progressive people. Uh, I'm not really involved in it yet. And uh, boy, it's, I've got other areas I work. I know there's other people that are really working in that area. But it's a weird one. I don't know. I mean, they bought lands that are already in a conservation easement, and we're wondering if they're going to try to reverse the easements. And it's very confusing. And they're they're going to the supervisors. And I don't know. Uh, you know, I could Tracy Ellison at the Solano Land Trust is involved, and I think Carol with him is starting to get involved with it. So um, it, that's a really weird deal. And um, you know, the best thing is if they could just push out to the Montezuma Hills and, and then conserve the whole Jefferson Prairie. I'd be like, all right, that's all right. You know, but we'll see because the Montezuma Hills are. You know, good for windmills and maybe some birds. So, yeah. Yeah.
populations that are near there. Um, and our, this ad hoc you know, process that you have, you know, going in, meeting landowners and whatnot, but are there opportunities that you see, like the Con California Conservation Genomics Project, right, where you can leverage genomic or you know, data of rare species, genetics, to incorporate that or overlay that with these other broader land conservation goals, right? Because I feel like, in one sense, there's a disconnect between these projects of leveraging, like, okay, you have rare plants and gene flow and things are happening, but then how is that actualized on the ground with conservation? Do you see opportunities to overlap or incorporate that with your work? Well, I guess my thought there, I mean, on one hand, you might be saying is if we get a genomic component, does it increase the ability to capture uh, conservation funds and conserve lands? Well, I've seen this thing go through, and we all have. It's called uh, ecological benefits, and um, I think that's what it is. It's ecological services. That came through about five years ago, and everyone was really excited about it. But I didn't see it translate into money conservation. I it just didn't see it come out. Um, I think that uh, it's driven at this point by by federally listed endangered species, uh, state listed endangered species, protected wetlands, uh, grasslands, uh, some rangeland conservation. You know, there has to be a program that has money or a private donor that wants to give money like the Packard Foundation. Uh, so to me, that sounds like at this point more of a bell. You know, it's like an interesting addition. But I think also, you know, we're targeting the areas that we think are the, the biodiversity rich areas, which I think is going to capture that. You know, there's a lot of discussion. Okay, you're getting the core of the of the population of succulent owls clover, and you're not getting the outlying populations. And something's gonna say, well, that's really stupid. You have to get the genetic diversity. Why not the little one over there? Well, true, um, but you know, where are we gonna put our money, and, and how are we gonna do that? It's it's. Um, so I tend to be kind of big and concentrated, and I've been criticized for that at times. You know, but I do have a section in each regional chapter about the resources that maybe aren't captured in the targeted blocks that are really important in this region and we ought to go for those ones, you know, like a little outlying population of Hartwig's Golden Sunburst in, in the Eastern Merced County or something like that. So you're aware of them and we can, we can conserve them as well. So that was the Carol Witham topic by their suggestion. She had, a, she had a nice influence on this book. Carol, you're out there somewhere, right? She's still here? Maybe she's not. So. Oh, there you are. Thank you, Carol. All right. Yeah. Oh, it's working this time. John, over here again. Or am okay. I interrupting? Yeah. I just wanted to say I, I also really appreciated uh, the fact that you had an opportunity to talk about relationships and, like, in conservation, your connection and relationships with individual landowners. Yeah. And how long, I mean, these are, these are true relationships. And so this trust and this honesty and the being real and recognizing where people are coming from. If you're speaking to someone who has a 5,000 acre ranch, a 3,000 acre ranch, yeah. or whatever it might be, <clears throat> it's that relationship that's gonna make things happen. Yeah. They don't, you have to care and be, and be respectful and have that rapport and have, I mean, that is ground zero right there. Yeah. That, if without that, there's, there's Jack. And so just having the cognizance and humility in that when you move forward. So again, congratulations and thanks for all your great work. A little side note on that one is that we were doing a deal with a ranch in, in uh, Madera County, and it was a mitigation deal with, for UC Merced before we moved to the Flying M Ranch. And it was a small area, it was like, I don't know, 100 acres, we we're gonna restore vernal pools, and they were paying a god awful lot of money to um, the ranch, it was like five million bucks. and. Um, uh, they built that ranch from the ground up. Uh, the, I'm going to say it out loud. The CDFW would, CDFW wouldn't get to it, to reviewing the documents. They said, oh, it'll happen, it'll happen. I said, no, really, you have to review the documents or it's going to fall apart. Ten days before the deal closed, and at, at July 1st, there was a $7 million fine on UC Merced. And ten days before, uh, CDFW gave some comments. They were very minor. One was, uh, you have to notify us. Uh, 24 hours in advance of using the herbicides rather than putting it in the report at the end of the year. Now, I think the rancher would have come around to saying, okay, but they only had 10 days to think about it. And he went and he sat under a tree. He told me this. He sat under a tree for an hour. He thought about his parents who founded the ranch. He thought about the whole thing. And he turned the deal down. And he said, no, 
I feel like they just want to control me, and I'm not into it. This is my ranch. And if they told me six months ago, we could have talked about it, but I feel like I'm being blackmailed. And I, he just turned it down. Everyone was shocked. I was part of the deal. We were in an LLC. I lost a chunk of money. And I was like, right on. That's good. That's what I love about ranchers is they, they decide on their own terms. And uh, it's, it's, they can't be bought, mostly. It's really cool. Um, these are ran I mean, they think a whole different way about money than, than any of us in this room does it. It's like if you had a 5,000 acre ranch and somebody said, hey, we're say 3,000 bucks an acre just to keep it like it is to keep it ranching. And they're like, uh, no, I don't think so. I'm like, really? <laughs> Jesus Christ. So it's really uh, profound to work with ranchers that have, it's a really different thought. And, and to John Hunt's point that, that you have to be aware of that. I remember another time I went out with Jim Cunningham and Merced early on in my work. And I was on an ATV. I hadn't ridden him really before. And we we're coming back to his home ranch down this kind of runway. And I was 33, and it felt pretty good. And I was like kind of gunning it. And he looked at me, and he goes like this. Just a, And I go, really? And I just rick and rip down this thing, you know. So it's a whole different safety environment. Uh, and it was so cool. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, when I did that, he was like, all right, John Walmer is pretty cool, and we did a deal. You know? So um, there's something about that. So being a country boy, I came from the country. That helps, too. So. All right, right on.